Hello, everybody. Thank you for um, your return. I know you must be very tired. Um, before I start, I want to thank dear Lisa and um, dear Craig for introducing me to Lisa and Hormos for letting this happen. The title of my presentation is Adapt Collecting Within Chaos. It's not going to be about my work. It's going to be about the people who inspired me. Um, and a discourse that I'm busy with since 2014. And let me start with a few epigraphs. خاطر نقاش در تصویر حسنش جمع بود تا به زلف او رسید آخر پریشانی کشید. The painter's attention was collected in the reflection of her beauty. As he reached the hair flock, alas, he painted chaos. King Muhammad Dara Shoku. Quote, Benjamin was at least convinced of one thing. What was needed was a visual, not a linear logic. The concepts were to be imagistically constructed according to the cognitive principle of montage. 19th century objects were to be made visible as the origin of the present. Susan Bachmores. The next epigraph is by Muhammad Deghwal Lahuri. The embodiment of being is a manifestation of selfhood. Whatever you see is from the hidden heart of being. When selfhood awakened itself, it made the thinkable world visible. Hundreds of worlds are hidden in its essence. Its alterity is evident in its affirmation. Seeds of sedition are strewn up upon the world. The self sees itself as other than itself. The last epigraph is from Encyclopedia Iranica under the entry on ADAP. <coughs> Apart from a genre of literature, adab in Persian means education, culture, good behavior, politeness, proper demeanor. Thus, it is closely linked with the concept of ethics. This lecture will be about a discourse that has seemed to be non-existent before 2014 to me. But by just imagining its application to field of visual arts, it has made me realize it is not only not non-existent, but by imagining it, it imagining it, it could be used to canonize a lineage of post-industrial Iranian visual artists who managed to not only incorporate the flood of modernism into the country, but they received it, heard its questions, and eventually answered them with their existent discourse on Adab. This is also a suggestion that it could be useful for any other cultural territory that uses Adab as an operating system. Therefore, this is not about my art. This is about, this is maybe about how I use the tools that, the, that painting practice gives me to think about the heterogeneous body of canons through which we think about art to eventually come up with an embodied discourse on visual arts, rituals, usage of language, and all that it entails. These canons are namely the painting tradition which I learned in European schools in Iran and abroad, the Persian poetry which I grew up with, immersed in its endless, exciting, and joyous usage, of, uh, usage in everyday life, and thirdly, the psychoanalytic theories through which today we can talk about the interaction of multiple frames of mind and their embodiments. Please, please lend me your poetic ears, as not only 15 minutes, but even 15 days of continuous talking about these subjects would not be enough to do justice to each of these discourses, let alone an attempt to embody them all together in such a short time. Here I should thank all those who have listened and suffered my endless talking about this subject. And it started for some dear people already from yesterday. As we have collection as a theme for our gathering, I will concentrate on the collecting aspect of painting, psychoanalysis, and adab. Saadi of Shiraz, the founder of Persian adab, quotes from Salman Farsi, the apostle of the prophet, when he is being asked, who did you learn Adab from? He replied, from those who do not have it. That must be sanctioning any intelligent speaker who dares to talk about this very essence of what Saadi calls the ultimate goal of humanity, not to claim to have command over Adab. Therefore, accept my disclaimer. <laughs> Thank you. I'm merely a tourist in the climate of Adab and Odaba, the people who have command over Adab. I'm only at best a traveler with the baggage of my Western art education and the will to be cosmopolitan. 
by living through cultures which use other means for casting goodness in human, I realized how much this most passive of ideas, that is at the same time the most influential concept in my culture, has been responsible for whatever good that has come out of our history. Or to put it differently, I thought it warrants a pause to think about a condition in which ethics and aesthetics are claimed to be one. For those of us who are unfamiliar with the history of Adab, let me go through a short historical survey. Adab primarily was a code of conduct for higher classes, so-called mirror of princes. Already before Islam, it had become a term used in Arabic, and in the earliest centuries of Islam, it had a detour to Persian, but this time enriched with two new concepts emerging out of it, adabiyat, a plural of adab, which means literature, and adab, another plural form, which means rituals. Therefore, soon after Islam, with the birth of Persian literature, the modern Persian literature, adab was not anymore limited to the highest ranks of society, but to anyone who could use the Persian language. In a few centuries after adopting Persian as the court language in three major empires of India, Iran, and Ottoman, Persian adab arrived at the new stage of producing ethos, as Dr. Dabashi periodizes its history. Right after the rise of the Western empires, which did not use the Persian language, the Odaba of Persian, Urdu, and Turkish languages had no new empire to move to, but to inhabit the public space. Therefore, during the long life of Adab, it liberated itself from being merely the mirror for the princes, but the mirror for all who can read the Book of Saadi and likes. We are talking about the 14th century onwards. Now let me jump into the work of Dr. Christopher Bolas, the renowned psychoanalyst and the author of China on the Mind. Through chapters titled such as Self as Poem, Rites of Passage, Life's Gate, and a Spiritual Integration, which lead up to the concluding chapter called The Group Mind, which we are here hopefully trying to achieve, Bolas shows us that generalizations about cultures are systems or frames of mind in making for centuries that at this point of history afford an encounter. The prime example of the successful integration of this to him is the British psychoanalysis, in which thanks to the great works of Dr. Winnicott, who turns the father-oriented psychoanalysis to mother-oriented one with the holding and containing qualities, meet with the jewelry of Indo-Iranian frame of mind introduced to British psychoanalysis through the very Dr. Masoud Khan. This is to Bolas just a beginning. The likely future of the integrated frames of mind of the world is a still to us but a collage. On this note, I want to remind us that collage is that one crucial keyword in modern art. However, let's try to see when was the other time that robustly one tried to make a possible montage of frames of mind as a result of daring to collage them together. So to cover the third topic, namely painting, let me introduce you to Mani, M-A-N-I the painter prophet who emerged in the third century in today Iraq. He was the prophet who mixed Christianity of his time together with Buddhism as well as Zoroastrianism. While using the traditions of the prophecy of his time, he was the first to incorporate painting and music for expressing his message. One can say he is the first known multimedia artist. Sadly, I will not be able to go deep into the history of Manichaean art and philosophy, but I want to suggest looking into the work of Mani is to look into the possibilities of the metaphysics of collage, something that we have been missing out on since the beginning of the last century. In his seminal paper published in Sino-Platonic Papers, Dr. Esma Ilipur gives a detailed analysis and comparison between Manichaean literature, which is pre-Islamic, and what, we call, what now we call the Sufi spiritualist discourse within the Persian poetry. In short, there is a millennium between Mani and Maulana Jalaluddin Rumi, who is uh, introduced to us, for sure. Yet the thousand years has marked the synthesis of many different frames of minds that Persian Adab was and is lucky to inherit. At the same time, there are numerous scholars, starting from Sir Thomas Walker Arnold, the renowned teacher of Sir Iqbal Lahuri, who, look into the, uh, looking into the comparative aspect of the work of money in visual arts from China all the way to Europe, gave what is today the history of Manichaean uh, art history. Here now we have a history of art 
that is connected throughout time and space from Ireland and Britain to Germany and Iran, expanding through Silk Road to Tibet as well as China and Japan, giving us Jesus a splendor. That's, the, that's a Manichaean title. Jesus, there are three Jesuses in, in Manichaean uh, religion. Jesus a splendor in Japanese tap tapestries as well as Buddhist residues in Persian paintings of early centuries after Islam, which Khaled also gave a remark of. On the other hand, we have a history of Persian poetry with its roots in the attempts of Buddhists, Muslims, Christian, and many more group, groups and people with their particular frames of minds who contributed to what we call today the history of Persian literature and Persian adapt. What does it mean to collect a multiplicity of frames of minds, however paradoxical and chaotic? Or better ask, what will happen when more than one frame of mind is employed by a speaking or a painting subject? Scholars of Adab are many. Starting from very early after the uh, arrival of Islam, Ibn Jahiz from the earliest centuries, all the way to the contemporary attempts to formulate what is Adab by scholars such as Dabashi, Dr. Sayyid Jawa Tabatabai, and Dr. Laura Marx. Reading there is amazing scholarship while trying to think of the ways through which the artists of the Persian world in the, most, in the last hundred years were influenced by Adab brought me to think of artists such as Kamal Ul-Mulk, Feridun Av, Farid al Shahi, Shohre Feizju, Nima Petkar, and many more, whose art couldn't be just defined through the canon of modernism. They were neither political artists, nor one can say, uh, in capital P, capital A, um, nor one can say they, uh, they, they, as subjects of art history, were always a apolitical. The closer I looked, I realized we venerate them, starting from Kamal al-Mulk, by, for example, movies uh, by Ali Hatami called Kamal al-Mulk, for what they did in the society they were living in. They weren't merely sensitive to color differences and com compositions. They thought through their aesthetics to think of assembly of humans, the righteousness of actions and things to be avoided. Looking at the works of European Orientalists such as Fitzgerald, Emerson, or Goethe wasn't enough to explain this phenomenon either. They were in awe, but they couldn't say what is the context which take, make, makes the text, uh, like the text of Hafez, to come out out of this Persian world. Probably Henri Corbin, French Iranologist and the translator of Heidegger into French, got closest to the context when he lectured Iranian professors back in the day in a lecture called The Forces of Iranian Traditional Philosophy in Iran Today. The necessity of thinking of history as nonlinear is indeed profoundly necessary for one to comprehend what was mentioned, but more so than that to remind us of Susan Backmore's remark on Benjamin's conviction, one can realize the necessity of constructing a visual material explanation of history or current affairs in order to be able to hold up a montage which is of reality to turn the salad bowl of collage to the boiling pot of assemblage, it is necessary to ask the artists whose goal have been to embody the multiplicity of canons that one needs to subscribe to, what needs to, one needs to subscribe to them in order to construct the subjectivity with goodness that makes one good, free, or an inspiration of goodness in others. Adab, as it was never something for an individual to have a command on, has been and is the discourse to be negotiated between two people or more. It was not a coincidence that Freud was looking at the works of Goethe and literary achievement of his time, which the World Republic of Letter Letters calls the marketplace of German literature, enjoying the incorporation of whatever good literary text that was there to enrich German literature. I want to finish with an example which embodies all that I said, I hope. The historians of art, Michael Newman and John Welshman, who I really owe a lot of this to them because of their uh, persistent listening to me, suggested to me, after hearing my long passionate explications of what theory of adab is, what would be an example of this? This example is also understandable if one thinks of Freud's famous couch, the couch which is supposed to stop the time and to make conjunctive associations possible to let us turn our troubled frames of mind to contain the democracy of the associations of contradicting thoughts and emotions. 
what is the example of Adab? Who is the most Adib? Who is the leader of Odaba? She is no one but Shahzad of the 1001 Nights. Together with her sister Dinazad, she used aesthetics to turn the maddened king into an ethical subject. Jorge Luis Borges, in a lecture at his hometown, elaborated the revolution that happened in European literature through the translation of the 1001 Nights. Since reading his essay, I have asked myself only one question. What would Shahzad do if she had to paint? Thank you. Thank you.